the book of the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 29. As the scriptures were read to us from 13 to 25, we will focus our attention in verse 18 where the wisest man this earth has ever seen pronounces these words where there is no vision the people perish although this truth is said in a negative connotation the message out of it is a positive one where there is no vision the people perish vision this is not about the bodily eyes and the sight with which we can see observe learn and imbibe this is a scriptural vision meaning a spiritual inspiration in the heart of a child of God. Dear brother just asked before the last song was sung how many of us recognize the purpose of life? Thank you brother for guiding us that way. Christian life is a life of vision. You know, very often this, this oft quoted saying, on hindsight, the vision is 2020. Meaning, we wish we would have done this differently, done that better, or done that in a more proper, appropriate manner. So we often look back and pronounce a better way of having handled a matter. But the Bible tells you, on foresight, not on hindsight, but on foresight to walk with a vision before you. Recently I asked a young person, where do you see yourself in five years? She said, oh, in college. So I asked another person, where do you see yourself in another ten years? And this person said, probably working somewhere in Shanghai because Manhattan would have by that time gone down. And I asked, another, I asked another person, where do you see yourself in three to five years? Oh, sitting and listening to you, Pastor? Answer to your own heart. Where do you see yourself in the future? Where do you see yourself in eternity? What is the vision with which you are progressing forward in your Christian walk? with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Is it without a purpose or life goes on, Sunday turns into Monday and into Tuesday and after the seventh day we come back to the same cycle. Life goes on. We get older, parties, anniversaries, functions, life moves on. Or is your life spent with a vision before you? The vision that the scripture wants to point out to a people of God is to keep looking to the Lord and when the Lord causes you to look to something that's the vision that God is placing before you. <clears throat> David the psalmist says because I have set the Lord before me I shall not be moved. Sometimes God is being told by many a Christian as if God is a broken down car who needs a lift and we as godly people without us he is not going to be known in this world we treat him as if a, a broken down car how many of us are willing to put the Lord on the driver's seat and say Lord take over I will go with the thou goes lead me on O Lord Christian life is a life with a vision Christian life is a life with a goal. Christian life is a life with a purpose to achieve. We progress day after day into the will of God. I'm going to place before you just a few examples. 
Look with me here in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 13, it's between an uncle and his nephew. Of course, some explain their relationship in a different way as brothers. So be it. Genesis chapter 13, the difference between Abraham and Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew, brother's son. Abraham was an idol worshipper, godless, and living his life into the best of ways that he thought was the best. Until God of glory appeared to him. In chapter 13, we see that Abraham and Lot had separated their ways. God had called Abraham with a purpose. Abraham walked with a vision. Abraham had a goal to achieve. Abraham had a target to pursue around to. Abraham had a purpose. He had fixed something in front of his eyes which the Lord had shown. And Abraham spent his lifetime day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, persevering towards what has been written in an indelible manner in his inner man. Life continued. He had flocks, he had herd, he had cattle, he had servants, he had family. He was a very wealthy man of his days. But nothing deterred him from following the vision the Lord set before him. Because the uncle went on a journey with a purpose, the nephew joined. A few years down the track, the nephew, Lot's herdsmen, and Abraham, the uncle, the herdsmen, they had a lot of misunderstandings. They couldn't get along well. As much as this friction developed into a more serious issue that Abraham and Lot sat down and discussed and look at the words of wisdom Abraham speaks there to Lot. Abraham told Lot, you choose where you want to go. If you choose to go to the right, I will go to the left. But if you choose to go to the left, then I will go to the right. When they both sat down to discuss, the older man, Abraham, the uncle, the richer man, the wiser man, all that he met in you, the man with a vision. Whether I walk to the left or to the right, I walk with a vision in front of me. But the other man, Lot, when he was given the freedom, choose where you want to go, choose what you want to do, and you decide for your life. Genesis chapter 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The next few words, very important. When Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that land, in his eyes, that land looked like as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you come unto Zohar. Lot walked with what his carnal, physical, bodily, external eyes saw, whilst Abraham walked by what his inner man perceived. Abraham had a vision inside. When Lot lifted up his eyes, he saw an ordinary land, an ordinary country, as a prosperous garden of the Lord, like Eden, if you will. Has he seen Eden before? But how could he visualize Eden? Because he thought Eden, the garden of God, is a place of earthly prosperity. And he, when he felt that this land is well watered, he thought, oh, this must be the garden of the Lord. Prosperous, flourishing, evergreen. 
and the hopes of can be pinned upon these things. Lot looked at a destructible, earthly, perishable, corruptible land as the garden of Lord. But Abraham allowed Lot to make his choice. Abraham's eyes were not upon his earthly prosperity. His eyes were upon the Lord God Almighty. He was a man with a vision in his heart to follow the voice that leads him day after day into the whole will of God. Verse 14. Only four verses difference between the two. Just four verses difference, but that eternity is miles apart. Look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lord was separated from him, mark these words, verse 14, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. I'll be foolish to ask a question, but let me be a fool this evening. What's the difference did you notice between verse 10 and verse 14? <coughs> verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes. Verse 14, God said unto Abraham, lift up now thine eyes. Do you see the difference between a man with a vision and a man whose eyes of understanding have been darkened? Lord, he lifted up his eyes and made the choice, but Abraham kept looking to God, and God said, Abraham, you have been looking unto me. Now I ask you to lift up your eyes and look at this place. God sets the vision for Abraham, while Lot walked half the third. That verse in Proverbs, where there is no vision, people perish. None other than Lot could be considered as a befitting, sad example of the verse, if you know the Bible history. Because Lot chose the place and thought to be like the garden of the Lord, ended up producing two forsaken generations, Moab and Ammon. What happened to his wife? Every visitor in the 21st century going to Israel tries to scratch and take a lick at the pillar of salt. Mrs. Lot that turned back and became a pillar of salt. What happened to his family? Did they not join the journey at the start with a man with a vision? Problems will come, but don't lose your vision, O Christian. Prosperity will come, but let not that blur your vision. Blessings will come. Never, never, never measure your Christianity by the blessings that you receive. Blessings are like fragments that fall, the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Blessings can never determine how good your spiritual life is. But make sure that your vision is brighter and brighter day after day. Lord lost the vision, ended up living in a land that deserved a fire and brimstone from God. Abraham pleaded that this man may not perish when fire and brimstone from heaven would descend. A man with a vision does not measure by these earthly jars, but a spiritual man measures it by the brightness of the understanding that God places in his inner man. Praise be to God. And what is your vision this evening, dear brother? 2014 is not the sum of bottom of life, a Latin expression or source of goodness. This is not eternity. When we'll be passing through 2014, it's already 12 days old. But whether 2014 or 2040 
or before the completion of this year, is your vision the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming soon. Let that be our vision before us. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. But Lot compromised something else for a garden of God. Example number two. During the days of prophets, at one time, the Assyrian army had encamped round about Israel. <coughs> and one early morning, the prophet Elisha, he was in his house. His servant left the house early morning. And when he came out of the house, he saw, he saw chariots of Assyrians encamped all around Israel and this servant got <coughs> scared. He came running to the prophet and said, Master, Master, what shall we do? What shall we do? How often we have panicked in life as like unto people who have no vision before us. Lack of vision, vision brings about a panic in the inner man. But Elijah was calm, peaceful inside. And Elisha told his servant that greater in number is he who is with us than those that are with the Assyrian king. The servant could not believe this. I'm telling you the story from 2 Kings chapter 6. He saw horses and chariots and great hosts that had come by night, verse 14, and come past the city thereof. Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? But the man of God, Elisha, said in verse 16, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. How is it that Elisha could see more with him, whilst the servant could not see even one with him? The differences are hot with a vision. A spirit that is revived for God. An inner man that is in tune with the voice of the word of God. Elisha was a man with a vision. While the servant Gehazi was a man who lost his vision. We know the story, don't we? How when Naaman came with leprosy and when Elisha said, go and dip yourself in Jordan seven times, you'll be all right. Naaman was very, very upset. He said, I am an army chief of my country. I have come to see this prophet. I thought he would come out of his house and receive me with dignity and honor and would pray over me an elegant prayer that something would take place. He sits inside and sends his servant and says, go and dip yourself in Jordan seven times. There are better rivers in my land, Abana and Farpa. How often we boast of the rivers of our states and of our country. Naaman did that too. But when he obeyed and dipped himself seven times, his flesh, his leprous flesh, became fresh as that of a child. He came back to the prophet and said, ask what you want, half of the kingdom or anything that you ask will be given to you. He said, no, I need nothing. A man with a vision is a content man in his heart. Naaman went. His servant Gehazi 
looked left and right and saw if the master is quiet and calm inside. He just quickly ran out and followed them and told the Elijah and said, Oh, my master actually by mistake said to you, he thought, you know, if he could give something, my master would be happy. He gave him a lot of things. As he walked inside, the man of God inside said, Where have you been? No, 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 nothing serious. He said, Did not my heart go with you when you went up to Naaman? The leprosy that left him shall cling to thee. Wow. What a word. The servant was without a vision, therefore, he was after this world, after the things, the perishable things of this world. Prosperity of this world is what he thought as a measure to be assured that God is with me. Don't make that mistake, dear brother, dear sister. If you're a man with a vision, then you will know that the Lord is with you without these exterior signs around. Now back to the portion in 2 Kings chapter 6 where... When the man of God said, more are they that are with us. Now here, verse 17. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. Verse 17 concludes, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The servant could not see even a single horse of God, a single chariot of fire of God that was with Elisha. Now tell me something. Fire. If your eyes miss it, your body can feel it. We learned from science three things on fire, the three colors that it has, blue, yellow, and orange, or red, or whatever. What are those three emitting? One gives light, the other gives heat, the other gives energy. The servant without a vision neither felt the heat of the chariots of fire of God, nor did he see the light of the chariots of fire of God, nor did his inner man receive an energy from the presence of God. Hearts without the vision can never see the provisions of God. But Elisha was a man with a vision. What these carnal eyes, what these bodily eyes, what these fleshly eyes could not see, his spirit perceived. That's the token for a man with a vision, dear brother, dear sister. Daily, day after day, do you envision the presence of God around you? Does the Lord send his angels to go with you to work? with your children to school? Do you see the presence of God with you? A man with a vision will survive through the thin of life. But a man without a vision will perish when all things are given to his favor. We read from Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel chapter 9 in the New Testament portion Jesus began his ministry at a very right age. And as Jesus began to perform the will of God as ministry, people were getting blessed by him. And whilst people were blessed, the disciples felt very good about it. They realized, I'm glad I left my fishing profession and joined this great. Why? Because he is the right man. He is going to be the king. So, so they often asked him, Master, is it now that you are going to establish your kingdom? Why? Why would they want to ask that? Oh, well, if he becomes the king, probably I will become the finance minister. This, that. But when Jesus was faced with these questions, they saw that his face was steadfast towards Jerusalem. 
what was waiting for him in Jerusalem? His coronation? His ordination? Or his presidency? What is waiting for him in Jerusalem? To be crucified. Jesus said, for this hour I came into this world. Meaning I have spent 33 and a half years for this minute of life. He lived with a vision before him. He always was steadfast. Look at those verses. I'm amazed at it. I'm sure you too will be glad. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, where we read from our New Testament portion. It came to pass, verse 51, when the time was come that he should be received up. Verse 51 says, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He didn't tell the Father, Father, ministry is flourishing, you know, thousands are getting saved, and a lot of lepers are being healed, blind are receiving their sight, lame are walking, dumb are speaking, even the dead are being raised. Can we extend my time by six more months to one quarter? No. Jesus was in this world with a vision. Good things happening through his life and ministry did not deter him to extend, to prolong, or to cut short. He lived with a vision. For this hour came I into the world, Jesus said. So people in the Samaritan, uh, Samaritan villages, in verse 52, they sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Was he going to accept a half a day reception on tour? No. He was with a vision before him. His time was in God's hand. Verse 53 says, They did not receive him. Why did they receive him? Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. How do you tell somebody where he's going from their face? Can you look at my face for a few seconds? There's light, bright light on it. Where do you think I'm going? looking at the light. Tell me where am I going? West Orange? Where do you think I'm going? They could look at the face of Jesus and say where he was going. Wow. Today we have GPS to guide us where we go. But what is inside of you more powerful than a GPS is a vision from God. A heart with a vision you know, the Indian Bata Shoe Company, probably my age bracket people will know, it released a lovely sandal for men called Pomadis. You know about them? Pomadis, yeah? We love them in our days, don't we? Pomadis, Greek term to mean, where are you going? That's the meaning of the word Pomadis. It means, where are you going? Are you wearing Pomadis? Where are you going? That's the meaning. From the sandals, people were to ask this question, but for Jesus, his face showed his map to eternity. Glory be to God. If a non-Christian looks at your face, does your face show the vision where you are going? Or would they say, my God, I don't want to go where you go. If you are going to church, look at your face. Or would they say, wow, where are you going? I want to join you. Hearts with a vision are an instrument of encouragement to another in this journey. We are all journeying through. America is not eternity. Neither is India eternity. Our citizenship is in heaven. Glory be to God. That's where our home is. A true Christian. I learned the song when I was first saved as an 18 year old young man. There's an old English hymn, I feel homesick for heaven. Since that day, it's been written in my heart and in my quiet hours, I sing it to my own self to cheer myself up, to be ready 
to go home when the call, the role is called the altar. I'm not waiting to die, but I'm waiting to go home. Dear Christian brother, Christian sister, God has given you and me another year to polish our vision of walking with the Lord. Let nothing stop us. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you about a certain man in Jesus' earthly times who had lost his vision. Of course, the example is of a bodily matter, but I infer a spiritual inspiration from it as I want to share that with you here today. It's here in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. That man looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, Jesus put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Now let's analyze this little by little, shall we? When Jesus came to a village or a town called Bethsaida, people brought a blind man to Jesus. And all that they asked Jesus was that he would just touch him. Why? They have seen and heard that if Jesus would touch whatever body ailment it is, it will vanish away and this man we be made bold. In Mark's Gospel alone, we have a record of nine different procedures that Jesus adopted in addressing the sick people to heal them. Sometimes he touched them. Sometimes he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Sometimes he rebuked. This time he spat. We can make a theology out of it. Nine ways of healing the sick. And I can publish a book and there are about a few people But the crux of the matter is, this man had lost his vision and Jesus is restoring his vision. Not the earthly procedure, but the spiritual step that Jesus led this man into. When he came to Bethsaida, they brought the blind man to him to touch. But verse 23, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Why? Why did Jesus take him out of the town? Well, what is he going to do anything extra outside the town? What he is going to do, he could do it here as well. Place doesn't matter, does it? It's the same Jesus. Hasn't he got powers to do it here? Why would he take him out there? Why? This is why we have the four <coughs> gospel to refer to to see why he did not perform this divine act in Bethsaida. Just before this, in his previous visit to Bethsaida, which Matthew records in his Gospel, Matthew chapter 11, in verse 25, scary words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Scary words. Verse 21, Matthew 11, 21, if you have a red letter edition, you will find these words in red color, meaning these words were uttered by the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, Woe unto the Chorazin! Woe unto the Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you 
had been done in Tyre and Zidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. In his previous visit to Bethsaida, he had already pronounced divine judgment upon the town. In a place where God's judgment has been pronounced, people may see it as a garden of the Lord. People may bring people to Christ to be touched by him. But Jesus knew if this man has to be restored his vision, he must be taken out of this cursed land. You see how sometimes our job situations move and suddenly all things seem to be going well. Suddenly we are uprooted and planted elsewhere. We wonder, has God forsaken me? Why is this happening? Dear brother, dear sister, leave those tears and cry for Godless to me. But you as a man and a woman of God with a vision, you may know why the Lord is leading you where he is leading you. That he might bless you. That he might restore a spiritual vision. That he might instill a vision in you. In modern electronic way to say, to put a chip into you. A vision. This man needs vision to be restored but cannot be done in the place where he is others will not understand people may question what's he going to do outside there what are he is doing why can't he do it here is he powerless what is he doing is he escaping if he is god <coughs> people will question your trial from their point of view but if you are a man with a vision you know that you are being held by hand by the Lord Jesus and you are being led out of where you are. Live your life like a king would live with a vision in your heart, dear brother. Don't be a coward. Don't be defeated. Live with a vision. Brother said, people may say things, but I have a purpose and that's why I serve my God, he said. Keep up your vision, brother. This <coughs> We are not beating about in the air. We are living with a vision by the mercies of God. He led him out of the town simply because in his previous visit, Bethsaida had been pronounced a judgment from God. People in Tyre and Zion, if they had heard what has been spoken to Bethsaida, long ago they would have repented in sackcloth and in ashes. Tyre and Zion are the ports sea coasts, sea ports. So a lot of <coughs> foreigners had come and established business so much so the Jewish community moved out of Tyre and Zidon and they came into the Judean region. But with Zidon, they lived very much within the area where God's word could come to them but lived a far worse life than Tyre and Zidon. Dear Christian brother, Christian sister, where you live is not of importance. Where you are going is of utmost importance. Whether I live in America or in India or in Australia or in Antarctica, where am I going? Jesus is coming soon. I want to be caught up by the coming of the Lord. I want to live with a vision before me. I want to place the coming of the Lord as a vision before me. Back to this blind man's case. He led him out of the town, but Jesus could have said, the men who brought him, Jesus could have told them, all, bring this guy out there, outside the town. Or he could have said, hand him over to my disciples, Peter and John, James and Bartholomew, Andrew, Matthew, you guys bring him out of the town. No, Jesus held him by his hand and led him. Why? The Lord Jesus is fulfilling a Mosaic law written in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Cursed is the man that misleads the blind. Blessed is the man that leads the blind. You see, in order to restore your vision, Jesus will not do anything against the legal issues. We try to twist God's arms 
by seeking prayers here, there, and everywhere, that some things might be done this way, that way. I remember one time a certain brother told me and said, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm carrying about 40 kilos airline staff. God should blind their eyes and let my luggage go. I prayed and said, Lord, let this man be caught today. Let him pay what he's supposed to pay and take. Otherwise, let him take only 20 kilos as a lump baggage. God doesn't bless us outside the law, you see. Don't, don't dupe yourself. Don't die your Christianity. Don't preach to the rest of the world that your God will do anything for you against the law. Oh, oh, oh. <coughs> no. Discipline your life. Yes, if you're carrying extra, they are permit two, three, four, five pounds extra or more or less. But if you still insist, please pay because God has blessed you with money. Please pay and take. Jesus fulfilled the law to lead this blind man to restore vision back to him. Fulfilled the law to him out. But interestingly, or in a scary way, without even touching him, praying for him, pronouncing the Father's blessing, Jesus did one thing straight. Jesus spat on this man's eyes. Why would Jesus do that? Why won't you spit on somebody? You see, when we now stand close and talk by mistake, we were spit falls out, we immediately take our handkerchief and say, sorry, excuse me, why? Because we realize today we put it in different words, impolite, rude, lack of etiquette, mannerism, or we tell all kinds of things. But the biblical way is, if you're spitting on a man, it means you have rebuked that man. You have rebuked that person. You have chastised that person. There are a lot of verses. We won't go to read any of them. But if you're interested to take down, here they are. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 8. Numbers chapter 12, verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 9. These are verses that teach the Mosaic law that if you are spitting on somebody, it means you are rebuking him. And the Bible says open rebuke is better than secret love. Jesus rebuked him openly. When Jesus spat on his eyes, sometimes what kindness cannot bring out, rebuke can bring out. You see? Sometimes when our children do something or put something in the mouth, we ask them in a kind way, what have you put inside, darling? What have you put inside? And if I go to shake the lip and say nothing. But you turn your voice and turn it. Tell me what have you put in? Mom, it's just a button. God also. If we being evil know how to do deal with our own children, how much more will our heavenly father deal with us? He rebukes us, not to destroy us, but that he might restore vision to us. This man was rebuked, but look at this. And when Jesus spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him and asked him what he saw, verse 24, he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Now here is my question to you, another dumb question, bear with my foolishness for one more time. Do you think he was born blind? I don't think so. Because he has earlier seen men, he has earlier seen trees. That's why the very first time his eyes are open, he says, I see men walking as trees. Men as trees walking. He had seen men before, he had seen trees before. Now the rebuke has brought out the cause of his blindness, the reason why he had lost his vision. He had earlier seen men. But how has he been seeing them? He has been seeing them as object of wood. These are not biblical analogies. If our eyes of understanding are open, we will easily understand who is man, who is a tree. Man is created in the image and likeness of God, while tree, wood, is an emblem of carnality and flesh. 
this man had lost his vision because he looked at man as an object of carnal attraction. That's why he had lost his sight. Romans chapter 1 explains these things. Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Rome, who had never heard such a gospel before, but he takes from the teachings of Moses and the apostle is beautifully providing it to the Roman church. In Romans chapter 1, we see him saying clearly how they had made the glory of the uncorruptible God into corruptible things of creation of animals and trees and things. As a result, verses below says, as a result, God had given them up to blindness. Blindness doesn't mean this physical blindness, spiritual blindness, meaning lack of vision. Dear brother, dear sister, the Lord encouraged me at the start of this year. And I want to encourage you with the encouragement with which I was visited by the mercies of God. That he gives us this year to come back to our first love, to our first faith, to our first hope to our first works, like how we were when we first became Christians. We had that zeal inside burning. We had that fire. Of course I was born to Christian parents. My grandparents, I've known my grandfather from both sides, they were Christians too. So I had not known any other religion to practice. But Christ came into my heart as my personal savior, not as the God of my fathers, but as my God, he came into my life. That day, I can never forget the joy that came into my soul. I want to come back and steadily progress in that grace. Losing a vision will make us blind. This man confessed to Jesus that he sees men as trees walking. And now, Jesus put his hands upon his eyes. Verse 25, the difference between Lot and Abraham, you will see it here. Verse 24, he was like Lot, he looked up and saw men as trees walking. Verse 25, he has become like Abraham. Why? Because Jesus made him look up, a man with a vision. His vision is restored to him now this time. When Jesus made him look up, he was restored. And the verse concludes with this amazing truth. This time, he saw every man clearly. Thanks be to God. When Jesus made him to look up, he didn't see every tree clearly, but he saw every man clearly. God wants to restore our vision of walking with the Lord. Let's quickly see a few reasons why Blindness comes into our lives. We have this exterior eyes. This sight is going on very, very well. God is, Jesus is not doing the job of an optometrist here. When I touched 40, I was pushed by everybody. Go and check your eyes, go and check your eyes, go and check your eyes, go and check your eyes. I said, so what? All right, to get them off my back, I looked and sat there. The, he put me on this chair and put on these different lenses in front of me and said, he would put this and say, can you see clearly? Is it blurred? What is that letter? He would remove it. Jesus is not doing that job with this man. But he's bringing the root of the blindness out of his life so that vision might be restored to him. Even so, God wants to do such a work in all of our lives, dear beloved, that we will have our spiritual vision restored to us. That we won't live the Christian life like yeah, normal life. Work, church, like how we go five days this, one day here. No. Walking with the Lord is with the vision. Let's look at a few verses in, here to begin with in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 14, the apostle is writing to the Corinthian church. By the way, Corinth was a very, very wealthy city. And today, New York is uh, doing a good job of uh, dictating money terms everywhere. Those days, Corinth did. By the way, the world's first medical college was started in Corinth. That's why most of the medical terms allow Greek terms. 
most of the medical terms are Greek terms because they started the science, medical science, first medical college was started for a very educated people, sophisticated people, but look at what the apostle is writing to them. Verse 14, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Tell me, dear brother, dear Christian friend, when was the last time you thoroughly enjoyed reading the Old Testament? Pastor, don't ask such questions from the pulpit. New Testament itself is a burden. David says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy scriptures, O God. If we turn to Christ, even in the Old Testament passage, we will see Jesus. You will see Jesus in the Garden of Eden. You will see him as a tree of life, when Eve and Adam failed miserably and God had to bring them out of the garden and when he pronounced Eve that the seed of the womb shall bruise the head of the serpent, you can see Jesus in the seed of the woman, can't you? You can see Jesus right from Genesis to Malachi last chapter. The son of righteousness shall arise with healings in his wings. Oh, that is... Jesus. To see Jesus, our minds must come out of our blindness. Enjoy the Bible, dear brother. Enjoy reading the Holy Scriptures. You will see Jesus. You will see these black letters jumping out of the white pages, taking a human form and entering into your spirit. And that's the glory of God. That's the power of the Holy Word uttered by the mouth of the Lord that will come inside you and develop shape and impart life into you. That is a life of vision. And again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he continues in verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world is waiting to blind our vision. He is waiting to see that we will lose the sight in the inner man. Yeah, when I was small, they all these old pastors, pretty old, 80s and 90s, every Sunday they would stand up they would say, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. 30 years have gone by. Yeah, of course he's coming. He will come sometime, but let me enjoy my life. The God of this world will blind, blind our vision, dear brother, dear sister. The God of this world. He will show a lot of things. He took Jesus to the top of the mountain. And guess what? He showed him the glory of the whole world in a moment and said, I will give you all this for. He thought Jesus was looking with him as the devil was showing him the glory of the world. He thought Jesus was looking with him. Oh, that's America. Oh, that's Tokyo. Oh, that's Shanghai. Jesus was not looking at what the devil was pointing. The devil was pointing to him the glory of the world, but Jesus was looking to the Father. He said, man shall not live by these things. To have the vision, the God of this world, if he dare go to Jesus and tempt him, who am I that he will come to me? I can be hit with a feather and I may feel like a thunderbolt. But if I have my heart with a vision for Jesus, then he is able to safely guide me through. The God of this world will come to blind in our vision, dearly beloved. Shake up, rise up. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 11, there you see the apostle teaching the saints. Let's not all the time blame the devil, but here is some important, serious cause. Chapter 2, verse 11. But he that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the
the darkness had blinded his eyes. Dear Christian friend, have no hatred against anyone. Have no hatred against anyone. Differences of opinion will come, but have no hatred. If there is hatred in the heart, it comes at the cost of replacing the vision in the soul that God places. Have no hatred against anybody. Jesus said, love your enemies. Have no hatred in your heart at all. In the Sermon on the Mount, which the world today calls Beatitudes, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus explained, the eye is the light of the whole body. If thy eye be single, the whole body is light. But if thy eye be evil, then the whole body is darkness. If the light be dark, how serious is that darkness, Jesus said. If thy eye be evil, we put the whole thing opposite. We say, the moment a baby is born, we say, evil light. So the baby's face is small, but the black spot is bigger than her chin. There is no evil eye outside that will ever hack your child. Jesus says, make sure that your eye is not evil. Make sure your eye is not evil. I remember as a young boy, my mom was a Catholic, dad was a professor. I remember <coughs> what all they did to rid me of evil eye. I wish I had known these scriptures then. That with a smile I will told my mom and my dad, there is no evil eye from outside that will attack me, your child. I should not have an evil eye. Pray for me, Mama. I would have said. Jesus said, if thy eye be evil, darkness comes into your soul. The vision gets lost. Let your heart be pure. For blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. The vision with which you can live, you will see God every day of life. Not in a human form, you will see His presence. You will feel His power. As I said, the fire, there are three ways of knowing there is fire light, heat, and energy. And many more ways you will know that God is with you. Glory be to God. And again, in Ephesians 4, verse 13. This time the apostle is teaching the church at Ephesus, telling them it's not only really just the blindness in the mind, it's blindness in the heart sometimes. Verse 18, he says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Let me conclude here, dearly beloved. The worst of all the blindnesses that I can think of, physical blindness, is not bad at all. Today the world is trying to put it in a polished, you know, challenged, and all, which is beautiful. I respect it. But what are we using? However polite and gentle we can put it, the path they go through, we can never feel the pain. We who have eyes to see, we can. That's my confession. But you know what? God doesn't shine away from the responsibility. He takes the orders upon himself to say, I created the blind, God says. So he is not talking about the physically challenged souls of this planet. But the worst of all the blindness that in my 30 years of 36 years of walk with the Lord, I have seen, I have been blind many times. The worst of blindness that I have been made to realize is when I can't see my mistakes which others can see in me. If others can see in me and point out a mistake, I rise up and justify myself. The worst of all blindness is what I can't see in my own life, which others can so distinctly notice and point to. How often as kids we have had this fun. Hey, look at those clouds. Very often clouds take different shapes. 
Suddenly, it's like a bow and an arrow. Suddenly, you see like a lion. Isn't it? The clouds take up all kinds of shapes. You tell your friend, hey, can you see a lion? Then, Where? Lion? Where? Come here and see. You can try and show many times, but they can't see. That's not blindness. Don't worry, because very soon the cloud will take another shape, plasma. It can take any state or any shape, any time. But the worst of all blindness is when I can't see my faults. If I can't see my faults, the psalmist says, who can understand his errors? Dear brother, dear sister, if you can see your fault, it means God is in the process of restoring your vision back to you. Hallelujah. Let me conclude with these words to you. Let us live with a vision. The, more than every other vision, the first is to see our own faults, to sanctify our lives, to purify our hearts, even as He is pure, in such a way May God brighten our vision and let him lift up our eyes and cause it upon his return. As the psalmist says, as the eyes of the servant behold the hands of the master, as the eyes of the maiden behold the hands of her mistress, so lift up we our eyes to the mountain from whence comes all our help. Our help comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Jacob, the father of Joseph, lost Joseph many years ago and lived with this understanding Joseph died being torn by wild beasts. I have proof. His multicolored coats, his blood stain, it's still with me. I've got my son's multicolored blood stain coat with me for the last many years. Jacob weeps. But the long story is come to, coming to an end when the brothers went because of the famine and found that Joseph was alive. And they came back and told Joseph, uh, Jacob, Father, your son, Joseph, is alive. And you know what? Jacob says, nah, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. They said, Dad, get up from your bed. See, he has sent these chariots from Egypt to take you to be where he is. Jacob said, what? Wow, chariots from Egypt? Egypt has come? Now I know Jacob is, Joseph is alive. Are you looking for proof? For a vision? Or are you living with a vision? How befitting does the word of God say? Some trust in horses and chariots but we will remember the name of the Lord. Dear brother, dear sister, if your heart is, a, is asleep, tap it gently, wake it up, because the Lord has come here to instill a vision back into your soul tonight. Hallelujah. That you will live like a victorious Christian. You will live as a man, as the woman of God, with a vision set before you. You won't look for prosperous things. God will lift up your eyes and cause you to behold what he is placing before you. May the Lord bless you with a vision to spend the rest of your life to walk in the will of God. God bless you. Thank you for your time. See you.